This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Henry VIII lived for 55 years and had many health issues, especially toward the end of his reign. That doesn't mean he was a healthy man prior to that. Henry's own interest in remedies and prescriptions were quite magnificent. The health of the king was often public knowledge, and as you'll discover in this episode, even his bowel movements were written about. Royals, like today, were celebrities. To be associated with the king could bring one wealth and power. And we know Henry VIII raised men who other monarchs may not have, because he was paranoid and he didn't trust people. Today, it's easy for us to take for granted 21st century medicine. In this episode, we look back at Tudor medicine. My guest today is historian Seamus O'Kelly. Seamus is the author of Pustules, Pestilence, and Pain, Tudor Treatments and Ailments of Henry VIII. I'm Rebecca Larson, host of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast and owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Telling the stories of those who lived centuries before us is what I enjoy doing most, whether it be a show on one subject or an interview with an author or historian. I'll bring you the tales of 16th century England. Before I get started today, I need to take a minute to thank Maureen M. for becoming a new patron. Thank you, Maureen. A full list of patrons can be found at TudorsDynastyPodcast.com. And if you'd like to become a patron, you can do so by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty, and then click Become a Patron. As a patron, you get all kinds of cool gifts. I do monthly patron gift giveaways that generally include books, and also right now the Tudor course. As a patron, you get advanced releases. Eventually, the tutor course will only be available to patrons, so be sure to sign up as a patron so that you can get access. All right, so you've waited long enough. Let's get on with the show. Seamus, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So let's begin a little bit with your background. How is it that you became so well-versed in tutor medicine? Um, well, so I started with, um, I'm a pharmacy technician, uh, my day-to-day job. So um, I work in a pharmacy and deal with uh, medicine and illnesses and stuff all the time. Um, And I also had some family members who were were fairly involved with herbs and plants and stuff like that. About a decade ago, I joined a uh, medieval recreation group and was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do in the realm of arts and science, which uh, can do, you know, pretty much anything that they did pre-1600s, we can recreate. And and so I was like, well, you know, what, what can I do? Well, I really like plants and uh, <laughs> I really like uh, medicine. And so I kind of just started from there and went all over 16 years, 1600 years of um, period medicine and kind of uh, realized, you know what, the Tudors are one of my favorite royal families. And uh, so I kind of just narrowed down onto that and just uh, started finding all of the sources and watching all of the documentaries and and just pulling in everything I could find about them, their medical staff, and the diagnostic and prescribing practices of Tudor medicine. So you, you mentioned briefly there that you got into um, the interest in plants and stuff at a young age. And in your book, you mention um, that you learned a lot from your grandmother and your mother. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah. So my, my mother's a nurse, but uh, she also, in my entire time growing up, ran a business with plants, uh, selling live plants, uh, preserving plants, making uh, home decor uh, with various plants and uh, had a shop. So I grew up in a business that that uh, dealt with plants. Uh, we had a garden my entire life, uh, a floodlight on the side of the house so that if she wanted to garden at three in the morning, she could just turn it on and <laughs> get in there and start <laughs> gardening. Uh, and my grandmother actually uh, was very interested in botany and was going to uh, school to become a botanist before she ended up uh, dropping out when she uh, met my grandfather 
unfortunately. But uh, fortunately for me, I guess, since I was born. But uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, she she had a, a huge garden uh, all the way around her house. And uh, so, you know, most of my fond memories of, as a child were helping either of them uh, or both of them in their gardens. And you mentioned, of course, that you have this fascination with the Tudors like so many of us. In your your book, um, Pustules, Pestilence, and Pain, Tudor Treatments and Ailments of Henry VIII, obviously something drew you to Henry VIII. What was that? What drew me to Henry originally, of course, is the drama. Um, you know, we all know the, the drama of Henry and his audacity of, of breaking from uh, the church to form his own and, and his, you know, drama with all his wives. And, um, but what really cemented my love of Henry was how much of a Renaissance prince he was. Um, he was, you know, he wrote music. He was involved in dancing. He was, you know, he did all these different studies. And we, we learn about his books that he wrote when he was younger about all these various topics and, how involved he was in the learned community as well as uh, forming various guilds and, and, you know, being very involved from a learned perspective, as well as he was very involved in apothecary and medical practices, uh, at least for a a ruling monarch. Um, So that really kind of cemented my love of Henry, his, his extracurricular activities uh, really, Uh, made me want to research him some more. So let's talk a little bit about the doctors of the Tudor era. What kind of man could become a physician of King Henry VIII? Uh, So, so Henry, um, Henry had a few, quite a few physicians. Uh, He inherited uh, one from his father, uh, Dr. Uh, Linacre, who had a he had a degree in Greek studies as well as Latin and philosophy and theology. Um, and then he later went back and got a master's in, uh, in his, his medical degree. So a lot of the doctors of the time actually were theologists. So uh, they were involved in, in the church. They were uh, priests. They were... Um, learned men that that studied philosophy um we have a modernly we have this idea that you go to school and you go through school and your end focus is to become a medical doctor and all of the classes you take on your way are very focused to that that area of study many of the tutor physicians were not that way uh they had a lot of other areas that they were masters of. Um, and so we see physicians who, um, you know, studied religions, they studied different languages. Um, and then on top of that, they got a medical degree. Others that he had, like Thomas Gale was actually a surgeon in his army. And so he had served with Henry and then, uh, Henry took him into his house and gave him a position as, as one of his physicians. So, you know, not, not all of them were medical doctors from the beginning. A lot of them also had a connection somehow with, with other people in court. It was a position where you didn't just see Henry, but you also were the physician for various other Royals peers. And so, a lot of the physicians that were at court were also, you know, connected socially with others in court. It was always about who you knew. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has always been that way. And one of the doctors that always comes to mind for me was William Butts. About what time did he come into the picture? Um, William Butts was about in the middle of Henry's reign. Um, I, I, honestly, I can't remember uh, the year that he he joined Henry, um, but he was um, he was a physician for Anne and George Boleyn, as well as uh, Jane Seymour, and was also Henry's son, uh, Henry Fitzroy's uh, physician. So, 
you know, about Anne Boleyn's era is about when he joined in there. So like the late 1520s into the 1530s. Yeah, probably. somewhere around there. I, I can't can't remember uh, what year for sure he joined in, but uh, he was about that time. Yes. And he he was the doctor. Correct me if I'm wrong. Who helped treat Anne Boleyn when um, was it the sweating sickness? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So one of the questions that I, I feel like often comes up is how did doctors back then or physicians, we should call them, right? Diagnose illness. So there were, were quite a few uh, different ways that they would diagnose and also ways that they would use that information to treat the patient. Um, one of my very favorite, which is a little weird, uh, is uroscopy. Uh, which is the study of the urine of the patient. And uh, if you do a quick uh, image search uh, for uroscopy wheel, you'll get this really cool image of 20 different little vials with round bottoms with all different colors. And uh, reds and browns and greens and blues, and those are all different types of urine colors that a patient could have. <laughs> Wait, um, I'm I'm looking at this right now and I see the blue one, <laughs> but I'm blown at blue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there actually are bacteria, which of course they didn't know uh what bacteria was at that point, but there are bacteria that will change your color, the color of your urine to those colors. And so they basically would you would uh urinate into this bottle and the physician would check uh, the if you had particulates in your urine, uh, if it was cloudy, if it was oily, what color it was, what it tasted like, yeah, uh, right, yeah, Ugh. the, and you know that was a a precursor. Uh, that was how we decided. You know, they checked to see if someone had diabetes was if there was sugar in their urine. Um, you can see uh, medieval and Renaissance pictures of physicians holding up the vial through a crack in the window uh, coverings to see how the light shines through. And so they would use your urine to determine, uh, you know, what ailment you had and whether you were likely to survive. They also did um, the study of astrological medicine. And so they could tell, you know, quite often what part of your body was ailing you. And so they didn't necessarily need to know sometimes, well, they actually needed to know, but they didn't think they needed to know uh, <laughs> what was actually hurting you um, or what was your ailment. But if they knew what type, uh, what part of your body was inf affected, they could pick a treatment that would help that part of your body. Because the idea was that each part of your body is ruled by an astrological sign. So like we think of, you know, I'm a Leo, um, which means, you know, I'm a natural leader. Uh, I'm supposed to have a mane and all these things, right? Um, Geminis are two-faced and have two different personalities, all these things. Um, in the Tudor times, they would look and say, well, it's your chest that is this alien. You have pain in your chest. We don't know what it is, but we know that, that your chest is ruled by Leo. So we need a plant that helps your part of your body that's ruled by Leo. And if we can figure out what the ailment is, then we can go the opposite. So we want whatever the opposite of Leo is to treat that. So we need a plant that either helps Leos or uh, fights Aquarian ailments, uh, which I, I was always thought was kind of cool. Um, astrological medicine is, is a really neat area of study. Yeah, completely wackadoo and <laughs> completely worthless, but right, it was yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, another uh, way that they would um, determine what you needed to do to treat a patient was with the doctrine of signatures. Um, so you know, they may not know exactly what is wrong with your eyes, but God has told us that this plant called eyebright is to be used on your eyes because the little flowers look like eyes. And so the idea was that God has put signs out there, has told us these plants should be used on these parts of your body. 
So even if we don't know for sure exactly what is troubling his eyes, we know we should use this plant that affects the eyes. Um, that's where you get liverwort, lungwort, um, and you know some of them still have the names. We still call those those to those by those names today. Um, but you know those plants got those names because of doctrine of signatures, uh, which I think is a really fun thing. Um, they're uh, the idea that you should eat walnuts for your brain because the walnuts look like little brains. Um, the uh, nodes on certain plants, if the plants have uh, little bumps on their roots, then that should be used in your lymph node systems and, and stuff like that. Uh, I always thought that was a pretty fun uh, and interesting diagnostic and prescribing technique. And then finally, a humoral theory, which... Um, you know, we can talk and talk and talk about humoral theory, but uh, that, the idea is, you know, we are made up of these four different humors. And if we can figure out which humor is out of balance, then we can treat you. Some of these things seem so ridiculous to us now. And obviously some of them worked and some of them didn't when we look at their life expectancy compared to what we have now. Right. And so I, I, it's actually a, a, thing I would really like to study some more, um, but I actually took Hildegard von Briggen's um, Physica, which one of her herbals, and cross-referenced all of the treatments in her herbal and to modern herbal uh, uses and found that about 18% of her treatments are used modernly for the same treatment that she used them for. So, you know, approximately one in five. So uh, <laughs> not super great odds. <laughs> no, no, not but at all. <laughs> at the same time, I was a little impressed that even it was even one in five. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you know, like I said, it's mind boggling for us now in the 21st century to think that they, you know, this is how they diagnose things. This is how they treated things. But obviously, modern medicine has evolved. So we have to think of it from a different perspective a little bit now. Well, especially because they didn't know what bacteria, viruses, uh, you know, pr uh, wow, the, uh, my mind just went out on me. <laughs> That's right. Things that are larger than bacteria, protozoas, ha! Um, they didn't know what, what any of those were. So when you don't know what is originally causing something, you don't have a building block to determine it. Like it, you're not getting any of the clues really. And so, I mean, you can't really build a solid case without knowing the very beginning. So it's, it's definitely, you know, of course they didn't really know. <laughs> let's, let's talk now a little bit about, um, Henry the eighth again. And can you list maybe a few of the ailments that he may have suffered from? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, he had um, uh, so in, in fifteen fourteen, uh, it's likely he had smallpox, um, which is no fun. Um, <laughs> uh, as well as in uh, fifteen twenty one, uh, he had what was called tertian fevers, um, and we believe modernly that that was malaria. Um, and what's really odd about malaria is we think of malaria as something you get when you go to Africa or, or you know, somewhere around the Mediterranean, uh, warmer places. But they actually had malaria in England at that time. Uh, there was a lot more swamps, a lot more mosquitoes, uh, you know, less developed land. Um, and so there actually, you know, were cases of in quite a few cases of them developing these tertian fevers. And the term tertian fever comes from the idea that the malaria um, actually causes your fevers to go away and come back about every three days. And so tertian means three. Uh, in 1524, he had his first jousting accident. Um, not a real bad one. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't learn um, and had another one in 1536. Um, but, uh, you know, he had a, a head wound. He forgot to put his visor down. Um, he had a, te a tennis accident in 1527 uh, where he twisted his ankle. Um, not a real big deal, but uh, 
you know, general first aid in, in Tudor times is just as entertaining as, as treating uh, weird ailments. Um, the uh, By about that same time, he also started getting swollen legs and he got an ulcer. And uh, some believe that it is due to the fact that he wore really tight garters because he was very fond of his calves. Um, and they didn't have like pantyhose, right? Like <laughs> there was no elastic. And so your hose that you were, your hosen were cut on the bias, which means they're cut at an angle. So the cloth has some stretch, but they're still, were not super, you know, they're not form fitting like pantyhose. So the best way to get a good show on your calf was to wear a really tight garter. And ah, as, thank right? you for explaining that. I always yeah. wondered why that was. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, your fabric, you can shape your, your hose in to, you know, shape, give the shape of your leg fairly well, but it's still going to be a little loose. Um, I have a pair of, of, of linen hosen that was made for me, and they're totally baggy a little bit right at the top of your calf. And if you're really trying to show off how, you know, the, the ratio difference between your knee and the, the thickest part of your calf... Um, <laughs> you got to get a garter in there to kind of tighten it up. Um, and so because of his tight garters, um, you know, he had a lot of blood flow issues, um, or at least that's what we believe. Right. Um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, information about his actual medical issues. Um, and that's actually fairly common clear throughout any, uh, Royal, uh, physicians world. You don't, when a person can have you beheaded at, at a whim, you don't want to leave around evidence when you screw up. <laughs> you this know? is true. So, um, you know, we don't have a written, you know, we don't have medical records like we have now where you go and pull up Henry's file and here's all the notes that his physicians made on him. But, you know, based on secondary sources and the talks around um, court, we can determine, you know, these are likely the things that happened to him. So he had, due to that uh, bad circulation, he developed ulcers, varicose veins, um, and his legs became swollen in about 1527 to 1528. Uh, then he had a second jousting accident, which I already mentioned, and that's the one that, you know, were uh, fairly well known. Uh, where he was unconscious for a period of time. Uh, the horse fell on him on his leg. The one that caused um, the Anne Boleyn blamed for her miscarriage uh, from the stress of finding out that he was unconscious. Uh, and then in 1537, his legs really became ulcerated. Um, he developed a fistula. Um, and then um, he also... Uh, by 1539 became very, very constipated, um, which, you know, it's kind of a minor thing now, right? Like we don't really think of it as a big deal. Um, I actually almost lost a grandparent to it, uh, though. Like it's not like we just kind of think of it as like it's a minor issue. You just you go and you take a laxative and you're fine. It can actually get fairly bad and, you know, it can cause, you know, blockage and, and you can, you know, die from it well henry uh did not have the greatest of wow mine went out on me again um, <laughs> his dietary um... his diet <laughs> yes his diet was not super great um and so you know we believe that he probably wasn't getting enough uh fiber high protein and you know all these things and so um he, he ended up with pretty bad constipation in 1539 um which actually has uh one of my favorite quotes um, about that was, uh, so Henry had, and most Tudor uh, or most monarchs had a groom of the stool. And uh, so this person was, was basically involved in your bathroom practices and was there to um, kind of oversee, uh, make sure you had everything while you were there and, um, and it was a very honored position, uh, <laughs> which just sounds terrible. Um, but one of the very f funniest letters to me, um, and so there's a source called uh, Letters of the Letters and Papers, Foreign and Domestic, Henry VIII. And it's a list of all the letters that come in and out of Henry's court. 
And uh, so his groom of the stool actually wrote in a letter uh, that Henry had slept until two of two of the clock in the morning when his grace rose to go to the stool, which by working of the pills and the glister that his highness had taken before had a very fair siege. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it just, it amazes me that this, um, this monarch ruler of this country, you know, has someone, you know, documenting his bathroom practices and how he just, there was no, privacy whatsoever it was it's very interesting uh yeah no privacy not that, at all <laughs> uh, terrible terrible you had mentioned um earlier the smallpox thing in 1514 and i recall reading somewhere or maybe i watched it in a movie one time so forgive me if i'm wrong but one of the treatments i think that elizabeth the first had for smallpox was was something about having scarlet, um, maybe scarlet material near the skin. Is there any truth to that? So I'm actually not familiar with that. So that's very interesting. Um, um, I have, I'm trying to think of why, just from what my research of why, why that would be a thing. Um, and I, I can't think of, why you would want scarlet near your skin. Um, so they believed particular types of fabrics would affect your, um, your humoral theories or your humoral balance. Um, there are, there actually are, uh, pictures of different types of fabric on patients, whether they needed to be warm or needed to be cool. Um, so like linen and wool and, and the types of years that you use them. So I, I know of many references where we talk about the type of fabric. Um, and of course, you know, the air that the, the patient needs to get, whether they're, they're locked in and, or they're getting fresh air or the, if the wind is blowing from a certain direction, you put them outside. Um, you know, if it's blowing from the east, you put them out. If it's blowing from the west, you don't things like that. But I've never actually heard of a particular color. So, um, that's very interesting, and I think well, I want to uh, kind of look into that some more. I hope it's not fiction. If it is, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it'll still be fun to find out either way. <laughs> <laughs> so if that, let's say that was a thing, and maybe uh -huh. it was an Elizabethan thing, obviously maybe it wasn't something that happened during Henry VIII's time. How did they treat him for smallpox then? Um, so, you know, they didn't know what, um, what was causing smallpox. Um, and so... I believe mostly what they did was they treated the symptoms of smallpox, um, which, you know, you have the pox that, you know, ultimately uh, has given its name. Um, and, you know, we're lucky that we don't have uh, smallpox now, thanks to vaccines. So you had all these pustules all over your um, skin, right? And they would pop and weep. And so I... I figured that it was very likely that they would want to treat those those pustules, get the swelling down. Um, and so um, I found a treatment in Bolin, which is uh, actually one of Henry's uh, medical staff. He was not a physician. He was called a uh, nurse surgeon. So he never got his medical, his doctorate. Uh, he never went to medical school to be a doctor, but uh, he had some medical training and was, you know, approximately you know, the level of a nurse nowadays. And he had a treatment that was actually four pustules that uh, used sulfur to help dry up the, uh, dry up the, the pustules if you mixed them with fasting spittle. So, um, which you, you're spit. So uh, if you haven't eaten first thing in the morning, uh, you can, you know, spit into a jar and save that for your uh, smallpox treatments. Um, you can use uh, vinegar and swine's grease to make this this paste that you would then put on your pustules to help dry them. Um, we also know that you get a fever uh, when you have smallpox, and so there are there are many um, fever treatments, um, and you know the ones that that likely work uh, if they have willow tree bark in them, right? Like we know that is the precursor to aspirin, so it probably would have helped. But a lot of them involve them drinking lots of water that has a herb in them. And so it's probably likely that it was a good uh, source of water for them and to get them to drink quite a lot. And so um, that was probably actually what helped them. And then 
um, we also know that with a, with a lot of fever, you're very restless. Um, and so to help Henry, you know, sleep better, um, I also found a, a smallpox or a sleep treatment from Dr. Bullen, which uses uh, poppies, uh, which we know is the precursor to uh, opium. And uh, as an opioid, it has the side effect of, of, of drowsiness. So um, those are some of the treatments that I thought might be used, um, but mostly to treat the symptoms and not really actually treat the ailment because they didn't know really what the was causing the smallpox. And you also mentioned his 1536 jousting accident as well, which was a was a big point in his reign when it seemed like things kind of began to change maybe with his mood yeah. a little bit. Um, I did notice that you had a section in your book about ulcer treatment. Was that because of the jousting accident, you think? Um, yeah. So so I think, it. you know, it's a combination. Um you know, part of it is from his bad circulation in his legs from wearing the garters and, you know, his getting these varicose veins, which, you know, if you have really bad varicose veins, they can ulcer, ulcerate and you can end up with, with skin ulcers. Um, so I think it's, it's a combination between having bad circulation and we know when you have bad circulation, you don't heal well. So he got this really bad, you know, wound that ended up, you know, uh, turning into a fistula, um, which is an infection between two, two organs or muscles. So you can get a, a fistula between two muscle sets that end up basically an infection in that area between. And so um, I, I think it's a combination. So he had this bad circulation. He, the horse fell on his leg. He ended up with a wound. And then because he doesn't have that good circulation, that wound just continued. Um, and so... I really think, you know, it's not only the circulation, but it also could be if he was diabetic um, from not having a good diet, you know, as we know, type two diabetes, um, you know, has a lot to do with our diet as, you know, as well as genetics, but um, you have a lot more sugar in your system. Uh, and we know that you can get more infections if you have um, diabetes. So I think it really just like his mood changes, we talk about the reason he had this mood change was X. And I really think it was a combination of multiple things. Um, and so his leg ulcers and his fistula, I think, was a combination of those three things. And if he was diabetic, he would have had issues with his wounds healing faster or, you know, not right. as fast as he should have. It right. all seems to point toward it. It really does. But I feel like nobody wants to say for certain that that was it because there isn't, it isn't documented. Right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we know you have all this extra sugar in your system. That's what, you know, many bacteria and all these things feed off of. And so if you have extra sugar in your system, you're giving, you're giving what your body's fighting against more food and more ability to fight against your body. Something else that you mentioned in your book that I thought was interesting was that Henry was involved in the creation of hundreds of prescriptions. Can you yes. expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So, so he was an amateur apothecary. He was, you know, interested in medicine. Uh, he was a bit of a germaphobe, uh, a hypochondriac. Uh, he was very, um, you know, his his dad, his brother, uh, both passed away from. Um, vapors uh and fevers and uh he he was we have records of sweating sickness hitting an area and he would move the court just super quick you know he would just be gone um and so from that he he was very interested in, in medicine and we have actually um at the royal uh, the british royal library sloan manuscript for uh, 1047 uh, was actually a handwritten uh, group of about 230 prescriptions that were written by him as well as four of his physicians. And scholars believe that he was involved in about half of them, which would be approximately 100 of them, um, which I think is just really neat. And so, um, you know, he you know, he wasn't just uh, this a king who had 
a group of physicians that worked on him. He was actually studying with them and and researching these treatments and trying to figure out, you know, better ways to treat people. I feel like people don't give Henry VIII credit for all the amazing things that he did during his reign. Who knew? Who knew he was so involved in medicine? Yeah, like, I mean, we don't want to... Uh, <laughs> We don't want to downplay uh, beheading your wife. Like, you know, that's <laughs> that is really bad, right? Like, what he did, you know, he was king and had the power. It wasn't right what he did, right? Right. Yes. Two wives, right? <laughs> Not right. just two one, wives. but two. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's what we focus on a lot: is this crazy, you know, the six wives he had and the killing two of them and leaving poor Catherine in a cold uh, castle away from her, her daughter and all these, you know, terrible things he did, but there were actually really cool things he did too, you know, like, um, and so, you know, I don't think that makes him a good person and it doesn't make up for what he did, but there just were a lot of really cool things that he did that I think, are fun to research as well. It makes him more fascinating. I think that's why people are so interested in him because he wasn't just this one-sided type of character from history. He was all about creating music and, you know, he was a great dancer and he built the Navy up much bigger than his father did. And he built all these castles and he was involved in medicine. Like, it's quite amazing. You know, he, so he started... Um, he, there was a medical act that he, uh, enacted in 1512 that actually made it illegal, uh, to practice medicine if you weren't, if you didn't know what you were doing. So basically it, it became an oversight. So if you had a physician, quote unquote, um, who didn't know what they were doing and were treating people incorrectly, they could actually be, you know, uh, there was actually some sort of uh, way to get back at them. And so, you know, up until that point, you had um, charlatans and people who didn't know what they're doing, making these treatments and selling them to people who just didn't do anything. You know, he he helped improve the medical system uh, just by that. And then, you know, he was involved in making the Royal Physicians Guild and um, the barber surgeons and, you know, helped to kind of bring... English medicine from the medieval times into the Renaissance. And so, you know, he was very, very involved in that. And there's actually, uh, you know, a a very famous painting of him with the barber surgeons. And he's got, um, you know, it's him on his throne. And he's got three or four physicians on one side, which were his physicians, Dr. Butts and um, Gail and... um, I can't remember the other two. And then on the other side were a bunch of other physicians, which were the first set of physicians that were joining the Barber Surgeons Guild. It's just, you know, he, so he's very involved in, you know, made laws and helped change and mold English medicine. Obviously, right now, the whole world is dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak, which we could probably call the modern pestilence. Yeah. How do you think the Tudors would have treated this? Uh, so they would have believed it was probably some vapor that um, that had uh, uh, entered them through um, the air. You know, so they they would have treated the fevers uh, that that we know you, you can have with it, um, and they probably would um, they probably would bleed you. Um, <laughs> so. We know that the COVID doesn't have a very productive cough. Um, that's one of the, you know, it's a dry, you're, you're not coughing up a lot of phlegm because the stuff is really just staying in your lungs, right? So we, we wouldn't think that they would believe that your phlegm was out of balance. So we know that you have a fever and you're hot, but you're dry. And so um, they would believe that due to humoral theory, you have too much blood. You're too hot and you're too dry. And so they would bleed you. Uh, and, you know, via leeches or uh, a fleam, which is a little cool tool that they use to uh, open up your veins. Um, and so they would uh, try and lower your blood levels uh, to try and rebalance you. Bloodletting, 
Not that I'm recommending anyone who has COVID <laughs> to bleed themselves. Yeah, please don't, please. <laughs> and, and, and you would assume by doing all this bloodletting that it would also weaken the patient, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, so there are some there are some medical practices where bleeding actually uh, is supposed to be helpful, um, but not very many. And most of the time, what you're doing is just. Uh, decrease in the person's blood and if you do it too much yes you're going to weaken them so it really was mostly just terrible it's awful but it's interesting awful. <laughs> yeah it is it definitely is and i've so enjoyed talking to you um, about tutor medicine and we have reached the part of the show where i ask you the five questions that i ask all of my guests all so right. these are meant to be a little bit more fun so the first Wait, one is my favorite questions before weren't fun <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm confused. <laughs> All right. They were, but <laughs> forget I said that. Okay. All right. If I could offer you a time machine and you could safely travel back in time to observe a place in time, when would you choose? Um, definitely uh, Tudor England. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, what time during Tudor England? Uh, I really like the the Anne Boleyn era, like not super long, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that time frame, um, I think is probably when I would, um, I would travel and, and observe. So which of the six of Henry's wives would you say is your favorite? Uh, I'm definitely an Anne Boleyn fan. I really like Catherine. Um, I think Catherine is super, um, I mean, stand by Henry and all the crap he did to her you know she was just amazing like that was just so I, I just can't even i can't even imagine there i don't think anyone today can really imagine what she went through um but yeah Anne boleyn you know she, and not even because of the way she's portrayed you know in modern and modern tutor, uh, she's kind of, you know, dangerous. And, you know, all these modern things kind of, I think, play off of it but uh, and make her bigger than she was. But I just think, you know, she got a raw deal. Um, she, you know, th she just seemed really neat. And, um, you know, of his, his wives, I think, she, you know, she's definitely my favorite. Uh, Jane Seymour seems super nice and sweet, you know, do we, we don't really, you know, and of course we're going off of secondhand, you know, 500 year old, 400 year old, uh, <laughs> you know, gossip accounts from of her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so, um, eh, we don't, we don't really know. Um, and Anne of Cleves totally, I think she's super fantastic too. Um, and actually I want to change my answer. Uh, it was not my final answer. I think I want to go with Anna Cleves. I think she was the smartest of them um, because she got a castle out of the deal. She gets to hang out with him and play cards and be, be his friend, but didn't get killed, didn't get shut away. Anne of Cleves, that's my final answer. <laughs> okay, well, now I have to ask, now that you've listed practically all of them, why don't you rank, rank them one to five? So if you're going to start with Anne of Cleves, would you say Anne Boleyn is next and then Catherine of Aragon? Yes. Okay, um, so then you're left with Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr. Who's who's number four? Um, probably Parr. I don't really care for Howard, so. <laughs> <laughs> she she you know to me Catherine Howard and Jane Seymour were always the two that I was least interested in because they seemed kind of boring to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean. At least Catherine Howard's, you know, life seemed a little bit more exciting, you know, obviously because she ended up being executed. So there's more drama involved in that than there was with Jane Seymour. But yeah, I get it. I get it. Catherine Howard's pretty low on the list for me, too. Yeah. And, and so it, it was a very short period of time. Right. And we she's also been fairly demonized in a lot of modern uh, interpretations of of Henry and his wives. So. Maybe maybe that's biased me a little bit against her. She really wasn't that terrible, but um, <laughs> I don't know. We eh. still, you know, we're like almost 500 years later and we're still talking about them. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. amazing. 
Okay, so the next one is, what are you currently reading, or what is the last thing that you read? Um, so I'm currently reading, um, I'm not very far into it, uh, it's a book about the royal apothecaries of, of England. Um, and so I actually mentioned uh, a book in, in my book uh, that is all about the royal uh, physicians, uh, which go from uh, Henry the Seventh. Uh, clear through um, all of the tutors and into uh, to James the first, um, and it basically goes through all of his uh, all of their physicians and the history of each physician and what that physician did. Um, and so they actually there's a book about the royal apothecaries, um, you know, which it, basically like the you know the pharmacists of the time. And so. Um, I'm currently reading that because I want to um, try and find more obscure sources that, uh, that, that, that have lists of treatments that I can pull from. Uh, one of Henry's uh, apothecaries actually has a bill that he sends at the very towards the end of Henry's reign, um, and actually might be just after his death, of a month's worth of treatments that he is charging Henry for. And so I kind of want to find more things like that, where we have these weird, obscure uh, treatments and that we can that I can find. Well, now you have me curious. I know you're always continuing your research, but is there a possibility that you'll have a second book? Um, so maybe. Uh, so the I would really like to work more with uh, the the prescription book that Henry and the four doctors uh, worked with. Um, it's only available at the British library. Uh, you have to pay them to make electric electronic copies of it. And so it's just, uh, not a very uh, well-known source. And so I would like to um, possibly do another book that's just focused on that particular one. Um, I would also like to do, um, you know some other uh, some other uh, royals like kind of drift away from Henry maybe and and you know maybe not too far you know like Elizabeth or or <laughs> you know but uh, kind of uh, find some other weird obscure um, uh, treatments and maybe uh, do a book on those so I think Edward the sixth could. Um prove to be an interesting one because i feel like he had some health issues especially toward oh, yeah. the end yeah it's a little it's a little out of my usual time frame but it's definitely something i would uh find very interesting that that the reign of edward the sixth at least the first part because i obviously have this obsession with thomas seymour who lived mm -hmm. until 1549 those first two years of edward the sixth reign to me are the most interesting after that i'm not as interested um, yeah, but, but it was very there's uh, it was all over the place. I mean, there was such a fight for power during that time as well. When right. you have all of these men who were ambitious, you had his two uncles. And then, of course, you had John John Dudley, who became um, the Duke of Northumberland and the president mm -hmm. of the council. I'm fascinating. You know what happened to Edward the six at the end? You know, I, I often wonder, you know, maybe I he mean, was poisoned. Yeah, so I mean, he was not super healthy, right? Like, we know from the beginning he wasn't very, which of course makes him a good target for poisoning because everyone's just going to be like, yeah, he was poisoned, right? Or he was he was sickly. We we know he just died. So yeah, I don't know. That'd be another fun thing was uh, uh, poisons of the era, and uh, you know, their their what they were made out of. Um, would be fun too right and how many people were probably actually murdered by poison and they never knew it right well you know there you know so we have this image right uh modernly of someone gets poisoned and they're at the dinner table and they stand up and grab their throat and you know they have all this foam coming out and you know it's big dramatic um thing right oh my god that person was poisoned right like it's obvious right um but you know there are a lot of a lot of uh poisons that just put you to sleep right and so uh if you could get someone in 
poison in their nightcap, right? Their their last drink of wine before they go to bed. Uh, they go to bed, fall asleep, and and just never wake up. So, also not saying poison people right before they go to sleep. I just want to make sure that <laughs> we, do, actually... we do not condone poisoning people. <laughs> no. <laughs> I should have never even mentioned it. Now I'm going to get hate emails. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Well, let's change the subject. Let, let's okay. get off of that. This one tends to stump all of my guests. So I'm sorry if this stumps you. But what is something that my listeners might be surprised to learn about you? So I've actually never finished uh, an official degree. Probably would be the thing that I think would surprise people. Um, I've. I went to six years of college. <laughs> and, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, but never actually finished a degree uh, because I was more interested in taking classes that I wanted to take. Um, uh, so I'm actually, uh, I, I, I've, I've actually just started teaching actually at our community college here, uh, the pharmacy technician program. Um, and a, a friend of mine actually works at the college and she's like, can I look up your your uh, your transcript? I'm like, sure. She goes, she looks at, she goes, you are th- two classes away from three degrees. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, she goes, why don't you just finish it? And I was like, oh, uh, I guess I could. You know, like, uh, um, I think that the important part of researching and history is not necessarily which degree you have, but the passion you have for it. And so. Um, I think that that would probably be what would be surprise people is that you know, I don't have a history degree. Um, I don't have um, what I have is a, a desire and a love of it. And I've spent a lot of time finding weird, obscure uh, <laughs> sources and um, and trying to find as many primary sources as possible. Um, so I think that's probably what would probably surprise people the most. And it, it has probably made you more driven, you know, that yeah. that passion for it has made you more driven to be successful in your research. Yeah, yeah. It, and, you know, uh, always, you know, I'm not a person who, uh, if a per- someone says, you know, you're wrong here, um, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe a little like, no, I don't think so. But uh, I'll go, okay, why? And then I'll, you know, I want to look at it and I want to, you know, try and figure it out and, and, and find um, why that person thinks it and try and, and figure out if they're correct. And I have no problem, you know, jumping back in and, and researching something again and, and trying to find more supporting uh, data. That's wonderful. It's as it should be, I think. Yeah, I think so. So Pustules, Pestilence, and Pain, where can people find your book? Uh, so it's on Amazon. Um, and uh, for a very long time, uh, if you just searched Pustules on Amazon, it was the first thing that came up. So I considered that a win. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's available on Amazon. Um, and if you just put in Pustules, if it's not the first thing, that's the second thing. Um, and it's got a cool picture of Henry on the front and a bunch of apothecary stuff. So it's hard to miss. It's not a very common uh, title for a book. So No, and it's a beautifully <laughs> made book. The pictures inside are wonderful. That's probably yeah, was, my favorite parts of lucky. it. My, um, I have some friends who own a photography business, uh, Vocalize Photography That Sings. Um, uh, worked with me and um, they did an amazing job. Uh, they're just so fantastic. So if you enjoyed this conversation today, please go to Amazon, order Seamus's book. You will not be disappointed. Seamus, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. This was fun. And that concludes this episode of the Tudors Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can find my show notes from this episode and how to become a patron at TudorsDynastyPodcast.com. Don't want to miss an episode? Be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Patreon, Podbean, or anywhere you can find podcasts. Intro and outro music called Folk Round by Kevin McLeod and Competech.com. Creative Commons license via filmmusic.io. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.